They actually didn't tell me I was talking about AI chips. <laughs> so that was news to me. That's going to be fun. And I didn't tell them the title, so I got told yesterday they printed it up as TBD. <laughs> and I thought that was a really good title. And then this morning I found out it was to be announced. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm catching up here. I got, I'll do the best I can. But uh, everybody knows what TBD means, right? Uh, to be determined, right? And, and, I, and I've, I've been talking about Moore's Law, and Riva Tez is with me. She gave a talk on uh, tech, technology optimism. Because lots of people think, for, for complicated reasons, that there's a complexity wall, Moore's Law is dead, we can't scale. And uh, I gave a talk at Berkeley, and the professors all asked me, can you convince people that there's future in computer science and transistors so they'll stop wasting all their time on AI software? <laughs> and uh, because, well, if somebody says, by the way, Moore's Law is dead and computer architecture innovation is over, and you're a college student, are you going to go into that? Like, it's not going to happen. But it's really a funny space, so let me uh, tell you a little story. And then <clears throat> at some point, I hope to make fun of everybody. Is everybody ready for that? I did know I was the slot after the slot of lunch, but I found out I'm the first one, so I'm the warm-up speaker post-lunch buzz. So uh, we'll get to it. I really like this quote. You know, for all the architectural development, the thing that really propels uh, AI research is computes just keep coming on pretty strong. And I have a theory about why that's true. And, and there's lots of people plotting stuff like this. So despite the fact that somehow or other transistor performance and CPU performance is slowing down, the amount of computes applied to AI is continuing to increase really fast. So when I joined Intel, I was somewhat surprised to start reading the headlines about Moore's Law. Like, like literally, like Intel's the Moore's Law company. And I joined it because I'm really a believer in that. And either it's a really bad career move or somehow it's not true. So I started talking about it. And then not too long ago, I got this little message. <laughs> that's, that's a mean tweet. Like, what are you going to do after that? I stayed home for a couple days, but I'm getting over it. But I'm really trying to figure this out, because it's not just this poor bastard who is working at a CPU company where they're going to drive more performance from what? Moore's Law. But these guys, this I totally don't get. Like GPUs is virtually like the Moore's Law consumer, right? Like Moore's Law goes in, GPUs come out, right? That's, that's the thing. And David Patterson's a brilliant guy. He built his career on the computer architecture revolution driven by what? Moore's Law. So then I had this, I, I had a dream last night. <laughs> and, and I had this little vision. So here these guys are up in the tower at, the, at NVIDIA's GPU factory, right? And somebody tells them, we're out of Moore's Law. And they go, great. I don't think that would happen, would it? Does everybody agree that would be crazy? Like if you're the more, you know, if you consume literally Moore's Law transistors coming in. So I just want to tell you a few things. So, so <clears throat> back at the uh, Moore's Law transistor mine, um, <laughs> like some of us, any, any transistor people here? One, two, three, four, any, five, yay. Anybody know what AI computers are made out of? A little better response on that one. <laughs> All right, so here's, here's what we believe, right? Moore's law is two, to, two, to, two times more transistors every two or three years, and it's driven by a whole bunch of things. Uh, transistor architecture, materials. We did FinFET transistors. We optically shrink things. There's, I did a couple talks on this. And, and there's so many components to it, and people get confused because they believe. I understand this thing driving Moore's law today, and I can see the end of it and then they think it's over, right? But what they don't understand is there's a million people working on thousands of technologies that are all moving it along. And, and to be honest, I think we're doing pretty good. Like, the transistor guys are delivering it, and then one or two of these curves is changing slope a little bit, and there's a belief that in the future it's getting worse. 
not true really. Um, but this is hardly the Moore's Law apocalypse, is it? Right? This has been so steady for so long, it's almost like a rule of, it's like a law. Okay. Transistors, and, and the reason I care, I care for a bunch of different reasons. One is, if I have twice as many transistors every two years and I'm trying to make you know, efficient, complex chips, and I'm not ready to deal with twice, imagine you have a factory and you get twice as many tires every year. Right? You better have some system to deal with twice as many every year. And the answer of doubling the head count every two years is not a thing. Right? That's not what's happened for 20 years. So more IP, bigger, more complicated IP. And we started looking at this, this chart. It's kind of hilarious. Right? Moore's law didn't scale everything the same. This is one thing that confuses people. Does that make sense? Right, Frequency, uh, transistors per core moved incredibly, 1,000x. Uh, wafer diameter only changed 2, 2x. Uh, number of mass layers is up 10. Look at the cost per transistor, down 10 million. Right, So the numbers are really interesting and variant. and depends on which piece of it you're looking at, different things happen. Right? Now, some technologies, like for example, power generation, when they started with like one or 10 watt generators, they were pretty small. And when they made a, a gigawatt generator, what happened? It got a lot bigger, like literally, right? Like some things in the world, when you make them bigger, they literally get bigger. Like gigawatt generators are really big in one watch. The gigawatt generator is not a billion one watt generators. Does that make sense? And then I was thinking about this picture. Like why didn't computers just get bigger? Right? I think the Cray 1 was the last time the world's fastest computing system was one CPU. Because the thing that came after this was the Cray YMP. Right? It was literally the last time we had a single processor in a box that was the fastest computer in the world. And ever since then, it's changed. Right? So, this is probably dumb. But ants and elephants, you know, an elephant's not a big ant. Right? Like, it's a really big animal, right? They're back basically both made out of exactly the same thing, cells about the same size, right? So way back when in evolution, cells were teeny tiny, and then they got bigger and bigger and bigger, but at some point, they reached the biggest cell size, right? And then cells got really complicated, and then there's symbiosis, and all kinds of crazy things happen inside cells, but we're literally made out of trillions of cells, which are all way more complicated, by the way, than a GPU factory. So that's pretty funny. Does that make sense? So we're in a world where we make faster and faster computers, and from a compute point of view, they're getting bigger and bigger, but they're actually made of smaller and smaller things, which is a little weird. And I think that's one reason this confuses people so much. So I'm going to talk a little bit about computers, and not just elephants, although I prefer that. I was talking to. Uh, some guys from some of uh, the research labs, and they, they had five problems on their list. And here's three of them. How do I program a million computers? How do I address, say, a peta object on millions of computers? Right? How do I do a peta lookup into a petabyte of data randomly? And I told them, this is the same three problems you guys have been talking to me for 20 or 30 years, except the decimal point move. It used to be how do I program 100 computers? And, how do I manage you know, a billion objects or a million objects? So we've had the same problem, stable, but the numbers have moved so far so fast, and, and we're struggling to deal with that. So what do you do in a Moore's Law world where you get twice as many transistors, which literally makes things more complicated all the time, and then how do you deal with it? And I'm gonna tell you about some stuff that I think works amazingly stably and some, a few things that don't. So everybody familiar with abstraction layers? So I was at digital equipment back in the 80s when DECnet phase four was one of the dominant networking specs, which is a beautiful thing. And they had a bunch of people working on DECnet phase five. And back then, networks weren't really well defined. It was like the network protocol was this box that did stuff. And TCP IP came along, and they really started a really clean layer diagram so that the layers could be well defined, built by different people and then innovated independently, right? 
and this stack is pretty well known, right? So we've been, we've been going through a whole bunch of design engineering at Intel because if you think about computing, how we build computers, like what's the devices, the circuits, the gates, the RTL, microarchitecture, ISA operating system, that stack is really well refined and really well differentiated. Right, when I worked at Digital and we built high performance out of order microprocessors, somebody asked me what the library was and I was quite proud about this and completely wrong. I said we use both kinds of devices, N devices and P devices, right? And we built custom processors laying out transistors, which was really fun back in 1996. It's completely not possible today. Today, if you go build technology on a foundry, there's a, there's a transistor definition, an interconnect definition, and then there's something called a PDK that defines how to use that. And then there's logic, memories, analog, yield, and that stack is highly differentiated and the pieces move really independently, right? In the old days of custom fabs for custom designs, hundreds of people dealt with that exchanging emails. In the modern world, we do that with an abstraction layer at many different levels. Does that make sense? And we were thinking about quality. We have the same, the same stack because you say this product has high quality, right? The quality is differentiated at a whole bunch of places. Is it a transistor issue? Is it a metal migration issue? Is it too much current through contacts? And all the way up through the stack, and we differentiate those things really carefully. Right. So, I said, the main three problems of the last 30 years for the high-end computing guys is basically compute, storage, and networking, right? And if you go look at a computer model, you think about the bottom, there's a data type, and then there's a compute model, and there's a memory model, and then there's a network, right? And on top of that is frameworks, APIs, and then software stacks, right? And one of the really interesting things, and this is happening in AI today, if you really are working in a, in a layer and the layer's all well constructed, you can make a lot of progress. But if the top layer says, to make this really fast, go change the bottom layers, right? Weird things are gonna happen. It's gonna get all tangled up. Does that make sense? And I, and I still remember when InfiniBand first came out, you know, they wanted to say, I want to move data from virtual memory on this computer to this one. And they ignored the OSI stack, right? And they put shortcuts through it and they wrote a 1300 page spec, which was like a cut right down the middle of the abstraction stack. And that went basically nowhere for years. And then they reframed it, which was, how do we have leading edge bandwidth in FIs with really good RDMA and just touch the layers we have to really, really carefully and that became a successful technology. Okay. Computing is interesting because I'm a, I'm a hardware guy. I'm a friend of the transistor and a processor architect. And when I talk to software people, you know, they, they write lots of software and stuff, but at the, at the computer level, you know, it really goes down to loads, operations, branches, and stores. And, you know, and we make those go fast by analyzing the graph of dependencies between the instructions and go through it and there's a whole bunch of nuance on how to build that, okay? But the funny thing is, it's weirdly easy in software to go describe radically different things, right? The first one we call scalar computing, A equals B plus C times D. Now, if you index that into an array, you can call that vector computing, right? The, 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 the code looks exactly the same. But now you might have a vector processor underneath. Next one, you can index through matrices and do matrix operations, right? Or you could have the addressing functions into a very large data set be some function of something or other, which can give you sparse computing. So we, as architects, we think of it as scalar, vector, matrix, spatial computing. And the coding looks pretty similar, but the implementations are all radically different. All right, so here's the uh, cartoon version of this. A scalar computer fetches instruction, decodes them, executes them, looks up a cache maybe and writes back an answer. A vector computer does basically the same thing, but when you get to the execution units, you have a vector of data we call SIMD, single instruction, multiple data, 
That's pretty straightforward. Matrix, well, same kind of story, except now they take the, the data you looked up and you drive through a matrix of operations. And then spatial is the wild one, and, and people are working on this really hard. In the world of very large data sets where performance is limited by bandwidth to the memory and locality of the data, the temptation is to say, oh, I'll put the data a whole bunch of places and I'll put compute next to the data. That sounds like a good idea because that reduces the latency in the compute, except so many of the problems are actually to do the computation you want. So I need to know the weight of that galaxy, that star, that black hole. And you actually have to get all that stuff together. And the question is, where does the data move, right? So four simple lines of code give you radically different computers with radically different outcomes. And AI, when it was dense neural networks, is kind of fun. You got a bunch of data, you run it through a matrix multiplier with you know, proper perturbations to that, it's pretty good. The, the, the next generation of machine learning is looking at very large, very sparse, very wild data sets, and it's, it's walking up that tree of complexity. Okay. I gave a talk a, a, a couple years ago about data models, and, and I'll just tell you, on the compute side, the thing that's been super stable forever is scalar computing. Right? You write a simple program, it executes in the order you thought it did. Makes sense. And it's easy to build a computer, it's easy to track what's going on. And there's a reason for that, I think, it's because human beings actually think in serial narrative. So if you go sit down and write, you have a problem you want to define, you start writing some code, and you just kind of write it in the order you want it to happen, and that's pretty easy. If you start trying to do that in parallel, it's not like an easy, vectorizable or matrix math operation, it's really hard to make parallel code go fast, right? And the other one that's super stable is on the left is global memory and DRAM, a cache of that, and the program sees all the data. That's been super easy to do, right? On the right, it's compute at a local memory where the data's all over the place, and you may have to control moving the data to you or control moving the answers to somewhere else. That's been super hard to do, okay? So I'll give you a couple of examples of what I think works. So everybody's familiar with C programs. I'm not a programmer, but I'm told this is an important program. <laughs> Has everybody written this program here? Yeah, a lot of hands going up there. It's no shame in that, it's perfectly fine. <laughs> So this program would compile into a serial set of programs, call a library, load some data, do some operations, and then store some characters to some device, right? And it's well understood how that program would go through a simple RISC processor. Fetch the instruction, decode it, read some registers, do the add or subtract or whatever, maybe look up memory and write the answers back. So that's, that's pretty straightforward to do. And there's literally millions of people who can do that, okay? This, on the other hand, is a SIMD program. And the problem with that is to really drive matrix or vector computation in SIMD, you have to figure out where the data is laid out, how to move that into a register, which operands inside that you want to do, and then have some method of figuring out what's going on. And the part on the left, I just, this is a Google presentation. Let's Google some SIMD code. It's like what they think the operations are gonna happen. And I know from personal experience, because as an architect, we thought, hey, we can write scalar programs, that's great. If we just make it eight wide, it'll be eight times as fast. And all those programmers who can write hello world will just write hello world, bracket seven colon zero colon, and, and, and have a vector program, but it didn't happen. I think there's something like 22 people in the world who can write fast SIMD code today. And is any of them here? I don't think so, I didn't recognize them. It, this is one of those kind of shocking things. Now GPUs, God love them, have been saying they're SIMD forever, and we tend to think of GPUs as looking like this. Arrays of compute elements, right, that do big wide vectors of pixels or something. And machine learning guys have kind of ridden that horse for a while and it's pretty exciting. Right? But I was talking to some GPU guys one day and they were describing the vector SIMD scalar unit and you know, I was sitting there going, 
you know those are different things, right? And, and, the, and the answer was, that's not how they were thinking about it because GPUs actually aren't SIMD engines for the most part. Right, if you go look at an OpenGL or DX shader program, what do you see? You see a scalar program, right? But then it runs a vector of those scalar programs on all the pixels, and machine learning on all elements of the array. And GPUs literally talk to global memory. And when we do G GPU scale out machines, what do we have? We have GPUs, which are vectors of scalars with global memory attached to each other with networks. Right? And on top of that is a framework to manage the API to run your code. Right? So they didn't do this thing. And uh, Jensen recently said that this is funny. They made GPU programming so easy. There's 1.2 million CUDA developers. And that's a really large number. And I think they made it so easy even dogs can do it. Not my dog. We're not that good. Now, you're going you're gonna to hear about some AI chips, and I've been watching this because it's really fascinating, because I'll give you the script for an AI startup. <laughs> Start with a big SIMD engine, instantiate lots of them so you have peak gigaflops, use local memory to control bandwidth and latency, leave out little details like exception privilege models and a whole bunch of other niceties that computers provide, make it really hard to program, and then execute this, this loop. <laughs> make it big enough, hand code the benchmarks, raise some money. Anybody heard this? Anybody working on this project? <laughs> Hire a really big compiler team, spend all your money. What's that? Hey, don't be mean. And then when you're out of money, repeat the loop until you have an exit, hit an exit criteria, which is a little undefined. Now, this is difficult, again, because the, our ability to build very dense computational engines is real. Our ability to manage and control those have been stable on some premises, but really not, not very stable on other ones. And we see that going as we move along. Now, there's another kind of widget that I quite like, um, which is accelerator. Because the, the stable engines today are CPUs, GPUs, and accelerators. And a lot of AI chips are properly accelerators. And, and you'll, you'll hear about some of them, right? An accelerator is something where there's some stable set of data and operands. There's a relatively defined and fixed method to go do computation on that, right? And then data goes in, you know, you set up the data, the data streams through the accelerator, you get the transformation you want, and we've had great success building things like scalar rotators and graphics, you know, uh, filters. There's a whole bunch of widgets that we think of as accelerators, and many of these accelerators started on a CPU or a GPU, right? But then when it was a stable function, you could say, hey, we could do a hardware optimization for that, which is 10x better. And that's usually the, if you go from like a CPU, general, very general purpose, to a GPU, more stylized, less general purpose, to an accelerator, depends on who you are, you argue, it's like five to 10x for each leap. And lots of startups say, hey, we're gonna get the accelerator benefit, but with the programmability of one of the other guys. And after watching that story for 30 years, it's not really a thing. Um, but this, this, this page came from Pete Bannon, and, and Pete, I, I asked Pete if I could use this, but I said he was brilliant, so he's brilliant, it was great. And if anybody else wants me to say that, send me your slides, I'll, uh... <laughs> he said the output of CAFE is actually a stable, interesting thing, because it defines, you know, images and weights, really defined set of instructions. Right? If I load the memories and then I say execute the instructions that come out of CAFE and build an engine that actually does that, there's literally no compiler. And that's how we, we basically built a chip that drove a car in 18 months. Because right? we skipped that step of how do we go transform 
a very complicated programming model of matrix or, or vector computing with compilers and said, this is an accelerator problem. Stable data, stable operations, go nail it. And then there's a GPU and a CPU in there to handle the stuff that's a little wigglier or less fixed. Okay. So back to the transistor guys. Right. We solve problems sometimes with abstraction layers. Right. We get more and more things. Right. And then other times you hit a you know a seam of gold and our good buddies here. Because again, people tell me all the time, well, Moore's Law is dead, Jim. You don't understand. We can't shrink that much more. You know, there's limits to this and that, but look what just happened to us. So if you go look at, so on the right, that's, or on the left, that's how we used to print an X, right, on a chip. So the optical wavelength let us resolve. It's 130 nanometer. We can resolve a little lower than that. You print an X. But as you know, we kept printing this finer and finer. And it turns out when you start printing finer than that, the light literally interferes with itself, which is kind of a drag, but it turns out that's a transverse function you can calculate. So the mask actually prints something different. So when it interferes with itself, you get an X on the chip. And that was, to be honest, was getting wiggler and wiggler. And on the right, what was happening just not too long ago in 2014. The thing you had to print to get an X was getting more complicated because the thing you were printing was much smaller in a wavelength of light. And there's you know, a million physicists working on this. So, and here's kind of what happened. So the world believes we shrunk transistors by having the wavelength of light get smaller. And at some point it kind of tapped out. And then between 2007 or eight there and 2018 or 19, Right? They were using all kinds of tricks to get the devices to keep shrinking. Right? And then we invented the UV and started bringing on that, that online. And if you do the math, we were just discussing it this morning, the 193 nanometer allowed us actually resolve to 80 nanometers without much trick. The 13.5 resolves to 8. 80 squared over 8 squared is 100x. So does everybody know that? Was that a big news in the newspapers? that EV machines is enabling a 100x shrink of transistors. That was the fine print under Moore's Law is dead, right? So the, so here we are in 2020 printing X's like they were meant to be printed. They're just X's. Now, there's a lot of room to go shrink the light and then there's room to do all the tricks because optics works and interference is a thing. And, you know, we'll do all those things. But at a whole bunch of other dimensions of this, we'll do it. So I just wanted to, you know, start the afternoon here and warm you up a little bit because what's to be, you know, my determination is Moore's Law, we have a roadmap for at least 10 years. Now, I've told people, like, I've been aware of Moore's Law for 30 years, and it's been dead in 10 the entire time. So that hasn't changed a bit, right? Solving complexity is one of these really challenging things because you have to solve it. When you get twice as many things, inherently things get kind of wild, and there's a whole bunch of ways to do that. One of them is abstraction layers, which changes a lot, and the other is really these step function innovations that come along. And, and change completely the way you think. And then there's also, there are things that have been remarkably stable as things that don't work very well that whole time, right? And, and I think, like generally speaking, and, and the machine learning gang, you're on the steep part of the curve, but the, the context of limits of technology and technology pessimism is really an interesting thing because if everybody believed it wasn't gonna move, it wouldn't move. When everybody collectively believes it's gonna move a lot, it moves pretty fast. And I think that's an important point to think about. So, thanks everybody. Thanks, Jim. We have time for a couple of questions. The mics are in the aisles, this aisle and that aisle, and there's a question over there. Uh, thank you. 
So um, it's very impressive to know that any two X in the um, in the most law is actually make on a thousand of innovation and then from the different field of hardware. And I want to know how much of that are, are doing things from scratch uh, versus they are they are making incremental uh, increase uh, improvement on, on different corner of, of of the domain. Yeah, it's, it's, everybody hear that question? Like, how much of the innovation is from scratch versus real new innovation? Yeah. And the answer is there's a lot of both. EUV is a really different technology. Um, the numbers on it are miraculous. Was it a, a, how, many, how many watts to get a milliwatt out? What's the ratio of power in the power up? Do you, uh, EUV is a really wild step function technology. Um, and I don't know if you remember way back when we printed one layer of metal on the other one. You put the first one down and the next one would go over like this and go over like that. The hill would get bigger and bigger and it would break. And somebody noticed so we could just grow oxide on top of it and literally sand it flat with sandpaper. Right? That's called planarized metal. It's literally sandpaper. So if you go look at the technologies, there's, there's lots of incremental change and there's lots of really different ones. FinFETs were a really different transistor gate around. The construction techniques for gate around transistors are hilarious and, and really interesting. So it's a mix. All right, thanks.